Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. That is, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo with Kim Strassel and Kyle Peterson. Kim, one quick question to finish up the Haley versus Trump discussion. Does Haley need a victory here in New Hampshire? She needs to show that Donald Trump can be vulnerable. That's got to be her main ambition. She's trying to set the stage for that with expectations management. She came out saying, look, Folks, let's remember, only one state has voted so far, and about half of the people said they wanted him, and half of the people said they did not. But at the same time, there's a lot of pressure on here uh, at the moment, and here's why. Because for the entirety of this race, Nikki Haley has been saying, look, if we can just get a one-on-one, that's where I've got my shot. So now here we are. Pence is out. Scott is out. Vivek Ramaswamy out. You know, DeSantis out. And she has got to show that she can at least get this somewhat close, especially because she's going into South Carolina, which is even more Trump territory. And she's going to need that kind of momentum to rack up some points back in her home state and to justify staying in. So I don't necessarily think she has to win, Paul, but she has to suggest that this is a real race. One of the things that's remarkable to me about this particular primary campaign is the media coverage. I've never seen the press corps so eager to call the whole thing off. I mean, they really want this to be over. They want to get the Trump Biden, I guess, I mean, you know, you can do the psychoanalysis of the media, but they're basically dumping all over Nikki Haley's prospects. It's remarkable to see. You'd think that journalists, if only for the drama of it, would like to see a race. Not this time, man. The only race they want to see is Trump v. Biden. All right, let's talk about Dean Phillips. Speaking of Joe Biden, he's the Minnesota Democrat running against Biden in New Hampshire. Biden's not on the ballot there, but Democrats are running a write-in campaign on his behalf. The Biden campaign didn't want to make New Hampshire the first primary because of how poorly he's always done in that state, 1988, 2008, 20. 20. Yes, Joe's been around that long. (laughs) He decided to make South Carolina the first primary instead, where he did well in 2020. But could that have been a mistake? Kyle. Yeah, it's a mistake in that it gives Dean Phillips this opening to post some good votes. But the mistake goes back to trying to rearrange, I think, the primary calendar, because that was the whole impetus for this. Joe Biden wanted to reward South Carolina as the state that delivered him the nomination in 2020 and also then repeat that and head off any talk of any challengers. And so he was trying to elevate South Carolina to the number one position. But New Hampshire has a long history of having the first in the nation primary, and it wasn't eager to let that go. And so it scheduled again a first in the nation primary. And then President Biden had the choice of buck the Democratic Party rules that he himself or his campaign had just had a hand in setting forth or not. And he decided to follow the rules as he was trying to help rearrange them. And so it gives us a a sort of odd position where you have a challenger to the president and it's not clear how much traction he's gaining. The president is running a write-in campaign or his allies are running a write-in campaign in New Hampshire. And no one quite knows how to grade this. And no matter the result, I think Biden is going to come out of this and say, we didn't really compete there. On to South Carolina we go. But if Dean Phillips posts, I don't know, a quarter of the vote or a third of the vote, certainly that will be taken as a sign of the president's weakness. And if the president goes on to lose in the general election, I think history will remember this as the warning shot, as it does for weakness in New Hampshire to George H.W. Bush in 1992 would be one example. Okay, so the other example, Gene McCarthy in 1968 challenging Lyndon Johnson, who also was not on the ballot, uh, did a write-in, and McCarthy got 42% of the vote. Let's listen to Dean Phillips tout a possible third-party run. Whether it is any third-party entity, if they have data that shows that by putting up a certain candidate who could actually take votes away from Donald Trump, if that's if it is a t- Trump-Biden matchup, why would we not all consider that? Why would all of you not consider that? But if you notice, Democrats are the ones that are attacking that entity and others with such fire the same way they're doing it to me, which makes me wonder what is really going on. 
Kim, what is really going on is the Democrats are afraid that a third party would take votes away from Joe Biden. I don't know what the impact of a third party campaign would be, but it's an interesting thing that Phillips floated to that. And I think we will probably see one if it's a Biden-Trump race. But how well do you think Phillips has to do in New Hampshire to really uh, make an impact on the psychology of Democrats? I think he's got to do a lot better than he's doing in the polls right now. I mean, some that come through say he's at 10, 15, 16 percent. As Kyle noted, this is a very difficult thing to gauge and to track. So it's unclear where it comes up. I think he's got to do more like above 30, 35, 40. He'd need to make an impact. And here's why I say this, Paul, because the press as you say, wants us to be over. They don't just want the Republican side to be over. They're not interested in this challenge to Biden either. And they don't have a lot of interest. They haven't given Dean Phillips very little airtime, very little notice, very little seriousness. And so I think he's got to really rack it up on the board to kind of force the press, as it were, and the country to sit up and pay attention. We'll see if he can do that. I thought his comments that were really interesting because, of course, the entity that he was talking about is the no labels outfit. And he was very clearly signaling to them that he would be open (laughs) to possibly serving on that ticket if they get to that point. And he also reiterated that he only thought that would be necessary if there was a Biden-Trump rematch. But do note that Dean Phillips has a pretty long and close relationship with Nancy Jacobson, who is the CEO of No Labels, because of his long time in the Problem Solvers Caucus um, and that group's interaction with moderates like that caucus in the House. So he knows her well. He's clearly been thinking about it. He talked for a while about the ins and outs of that ticket and how it would look and what it might potential impact would be on the race. But I think as we get closer to a Trump-Biden rematch, if this is where we're headed, you're going to hear a lot more about these independent runs. Oh, I couldn't agree more, Kim. I know there's a debate inside the uh, No Labels camp about uh, whether it would be wise to put a Republican at the top of the ticket or a Democrat. Mm. Obviously, it'd be a crucial decision, as well as who that personality is, who the political candidate is, and the running mate, though, that will be crucial uh, if they do get, decide to move ahead. But I guess Dean Phillips could be one of those uh, possibilities. All right, Kim, thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you all for listening. We're here every day on Potomac Watch. So please join us again tomorrow and uh, the rest of the week as we parse the results from New Hampshire.